So, good evening, everyone, and welcome and thank you for joining us today for our latest Kari online lecture. I'm Lindy Crew, Kari's director, and it's my pleasure this evening to introduce our speaker, Dr. Erin Walsak Averett. Dr. Walsak Averett was awarded her PhD in 2007 from the University of Missouri on the topic dedications in clay terracotta figurines in early Iron Age Greece. From 2008, she held the role of assistant professor in archaeology at Crichton University. From 2015, she has held the post of associate professor in archaeology in the Department of Fine and Performing Arts at Crichton. Dr. Averett has worked in a number of museums and galleries and since 2013 has served as adjunct curator of antiquities at the Jocelyn Art Museum in Omaha, providing opportunities for her students to research dissertation topics and obtain curatorial experience, as well as curating temporary exhibitions. Dr. Averett has served on a number of committees and boards and including as a Curry trustee from 2013 to 2019. And we hope that you will return to the Curry board for another term before too long. Mm -hmm. Since 1988, 1998, Erin has been involved with the Athienu Archaeological Project, directed by Professor Michael Tomasu, first as an excavator and materials specialist, and since 2003 as assistant director. The team is now working towards publication and of the archaeology of Athienu Malura and the surrounding valley located in the Mesaria Plain. The survey and excavation undertaken by the AAP encompasses around 30 sites of various periods from prehistoric, classical Hellenistic and small hilltop sites dating from late Roman through Ottoman times. The most extensively studied is the important Cypro-Archaic to Roman rural sanctuary we will hear about today. Erin's research interests include ancient religion, figurine studies, Eastern Mediterranean interactions, the construction of gender in the ancient Mediterranean, digital archaeology, and 3D imaging. She's the author of multiple single and co-authored research articles and is responsible for publishing the terracotta figurines from the rural sanctuary at Athianu Malura. Along with her co-authors, Derek Counts, Kevin Garski, and Michael Tomazu, Dr. Averett has recently published Visualizing Votive Practice, Limestone and Terracotta Sculpture from Athianu Malura through 3D Models. And you can read more about and indeed download this innovative digital volume through the Kari website by visiting the newsletters page and clicking on the March 2021 issue. I would now like to invite Dr. Walsek Averett to present her lecture entitled Beyond Representation, Cypriot Rural Sanctuaries as Vibrant Assemblages. Thank you. Great. Um, good evening or morning or afternoon. And thank you, Lindy, for that introduction and the generous invitation to give um, a talk here today. I'm excited to share my newest research with you, which continues to explore votive religion at Athenu Malara. But I've recently started to rethink how votives work, inspired by some new theoretical approaches that ask us to question traditional divisions between things. Cypriot religious spaces are the perfect places to explore these new ideas since they are spaces where we already know divisions collided. And so I'd like to share this um, very much work in progress with you today and I welcome any um, feedback or criticisms. The views towards Cypriot art presented here by Frederick Norman Price in 1931 are quite typical for the time and are familiar to most of us that study Cyprus today. He says, the archeological remains of Cyprus are so distinctive, so unlike any other Mediterranean area that the most varied opinions have been held as to the position to be assigned to the island in ancient history. It has been considered one of the original foci of civilization or an integral link in the chain of communication between East and West. On the other hand, it is possible to regard the island as a stagnant backwater into which odds and ends of the culture of neighboring nations strayed at intervals. And this seems to be the correct point of view in respect of the sculpture. The artistic production of the island was thus simultaneously viewed as unique and interesting as products of the island as a dynamic crossroads, but at the same time, it could be derided as stale and conservative products of a backwater. Although scholars now reject such negative views, the framing of Cypriot art as somehow conservative or repetitive persists 
even if couched in less explicitly negative terms. Antiquarian excavations on the island in the 19th century unearthed a wealth of spectacular figural art that created a sensation and eventually formed integral components of many European and American museums. Yet from these first findings, Cypriot art was caught between worlds, neither Greek nor Near Eastern, aesthetically interesting or shocking bad art, Cypriot artifacts were ambivalently received by both scholars and museum visitors, as Anne-Marie Knobloch has recently explored. Early scholars applied universalist and essentialist aesthetic models to Cypriot art, proclaiming it of lesser quality and inferior to the more naturalistic Greek art. While this aesthetic approach fell out of favor, the study of Cypriot art in the later 20th century continued to rely on traditional art historical methods to analyze formal qualities, especially style and iconography, in order to establish typologies and chronologies of material classes. These approaches essentially neutralized these objects by privileging their formal qualities over their social relationships and how they functioned in Cypriot sanctuaries. By privileging votives as art objects, there is an underlying assumption that they are representational, meaning they signify the ideas of the patron that commissioned them, or the artist who made them, or the worshiper who obtained them, and therefore that they reflect the values of the society that created them. Style and iconography were also used to identify external influences as if style was imprinted upon them, or even to support the tenuous evidence for foreign domination, colonization, or migration that became common ways to interpret change on an island considered a crossroads. The time is ripe to approach Cypriot art from a different angle. Inspired by new approaches to things, this contribution considers the way objects functioned in Cypriot society, how they were efficacious, their social roles, and how they enacted agency through interactions with other things and people. My talk today will focus on a particular type of art, votive figurines and statues, to explore new ways of understanding how these objects worked and why so many of them were long lasting. My study will use the rural sanctuary at Athenu Malara, which was scientifically excavated and therefore provides nuanced details on votive context over the long use of the sanctuary as a case study. By exploring how votive dedications worked, we find that far from being products of a stagnant backwater or exemplifying some sort of innate conservativeness, Cypriot art was highly effectual, even as the use and nature of these sanctuaries changed over long periods of time. I want to explore how Cypriot art functioned by applying a suite of theoretical perspectives that can be broadly grouped under the concept of post-humanism. These critical theories share a common goal to decenter the human experience and explore alternate ways of understanding the world to explode ingrained dualistic categories such as culture versus nature, human versus thing, human, animal, mind, body, material, immaterial, and instead understand these categories, boundaries, and relationships as porous, unfixed, and always changing in a constant state of becoming. As boundaries and relationships are questioned, the already contested nature of agency is further complicated in post-humanistic approaches. Although the various theoretical perspectives do not agree on details, there is a general consensus that agency is not exclusively anthropomorphic and that things, animals, and landscapes can also exert some form of agency. In particular, today I apply these theoretical approaches to votive objects through the perspective of new materialism and assemblage theory. New materialism emphasizes the materiality of things and their entangled relationships with humans and animals and landscapes by rethinking the property of matter itself and materials in the context of new ways of thinking about the world. And although the literature on this is vast, I just want to call out one recent book that was very influential for my work. This is an edited volume by Lucia Tala and Louise Steele, 
And in particular, Steele has very creatively um, applied these perspectives to Cypriot tomb groups. New materialism calls attention to how matter changes, develops, merges, and is always in a state of becoming and interacting with other things and necessitates a focus on experience. And these views matter is seen as vibrant, fluid, and dynamic. Rather than being defined by discrete boundaries, the properties of things emerge through their relationships. Assemblage theory is um, a less coherent theory and a little bit more difficult to, to grasp than a set of theoretical tools and ideas, which can be related to new materialism. This perspective recognizes that things emerge through their relationship with the world, and these relationships are called assemblages. Assemblages can be associations of things, materials, ideas, and living things. They are temporary and heterogeneous, and as Yanis Hamalakis describes, about the relationship of in-betweenness. And unlike our traditional archaeological use of the term assemblage, assemblages in this perspective are not chronologically bound. Like new materialism, assemblage theory understands things as dynamic and active. It also understands the world as consisting of assemblages existing in a constant state of flux and becoming. And so just to give some examples of this, assemblages can range from things. So a terracotta figurine is an assemblage of clay, inclusions, water, and maybe pigments. They can be events. A figurine is crafted by a choroplast working with materials and tools coming together in one moment. To landscapes constructed through relationships between humans, animals, things, and the environment. To concepts such as a household, Assemblages are not static, but are in, uh, um, uh, fluid processes in a constant state of flux. For example, a statue is originally formed as an assemblage between materials and a sculptor, but it then becomes part of another assemblage as it is dedicated in a sanctuary, and then changes assemblages again as it is used for construction fill, as you see here. Once the statue is excavated in 2019 by an archaeologist, it then joins a new assemblage. And here we have Mike Tomazu, even if he can't join us live. Um, it can join a new assemblage as excavators and visitors at the site marvel at the statue. And then it can join a different assemblage in the lab as it is conserved and prepped to turn over to the museum. And in the museum, it can join a new assemblage as it is viewed behind a glass case no longer able to be touched, only seen by visitors. We could explore the same flux with the household assemblage as people, architecture, and things are constantly restructured or even destroyed, and as part of the household can join and leave other assemblages. In this way, assemblages are not stable. They disrupt any understanding of temporal or physical boundaries. They explode linear notions of time, and they can destabilize traditional concepts. And so my talk will experimentally apply these theoretical perspectives to figural votives from Iron Age rural sanctuaries using Athena Malara, uh, marked on this map by the red triangle as a case study. And I thank Yorgos again for his very generous um, uh, allowing me to use this map again. This period was selected because it witnessed several major social, political, and social um, cultural transformations. The city kingdoms, which emerged at some point in the Cipro geomet geometric period, were firmly in place by the 8th century. These polities, however, were not stable, and in the Cipro archaic and classical periods um, um, were a time of destabilization as kingdoms vied for power and their numbers grew and contracted. As these kingdoms were emerging, growing, and consolidating, we see the establishment of sanctuaries marked here with black triangles across the island, and in particular, the growth of rural sanctuaries. Our understanding of the Malara sanctuary is hindered in the same ways um, as most Cypriot sanctuaries are by the paucity of textual sources and the complexities of the iconography. The archaeological evidence, artistic depictions, and inscriptions allow us to partially reconstruct ritual activities, including images of deities, animal sacrifice, feasting, music, 
dance, the burning of incense, the lighting of lamps, prayer, masked performances, and offerings to the divine, even if the details of specific events, deities, and beliefs are lost. As I hope to demonstrate today, these delineated religious spaces were dynamic places where humans, animals, things, and the supernatural collided to perform and co-create religious spheres that were distinct, yet also extensions of settlement areas and mortuary landscapes. While the finds within the sanctuaries are remnants of activities performed, some artistic representation, like this very well-known fourth century stele from nearby Golgoy, remind us of the people and the divinities that used these spaces, collapsing time and boundaries between mortal and divine worlds. And here we see a family and worshiper bringing offerings and praying to Apollo, who is enthroned behind his altar, while worshipers dance, play, music, and banquet below. By analyzing sanctuaries as assemblages, we can begin to understand how all of these elements work together. These assemblages or relationships went beyond merely representing social values and identities as if a passive mirror reflecting a singular past reality. Instead, they are dynamic and vibrant processes where the relationships between people, gods, animals, and things were co-created and articulated. Before we jump in to look at the votives, I want to zoom out a minute to consider the role of landscape in the creation of these sanctuaries. There has been extensive scholarship on non-urban sanctuaries um, and that these scholars have already explored the proliferation of these sanctuaries concurrent with the rise and reorganization of the kingdoms and the likely relationship between the royal capitals and territorial claims through their establishment, as well as the spread of artistic styles from kingdom workshop to rural craft centers. It is clear that the ruling and the elite use these spaces to negotiate social and political power through participation in religious ritual and votive dedication. If we switch perspectives, however, a broader understanding emerges. Rather than a top-down approach to land use, rulers imposing ideologies on passive rural areas, a bottom-up perspective reveals that landscapes are not mere backdrops to urban development. As Tim Engel notes, landscapes are neither natural nor passive. Turning away from urban centers, new research has demonstrated that ancient countrysides are equally vital and that they are messy, complex, and intimately entwined with village and urban centers. Thomas Garrison and colleagues highlight the ways landscapes were dynamically created and used, urging us to, quote, go beyond understanding the countryside as an inert agro-pastoralist landscape, or as a place to mark territory, or places to traverse route to urban centers. And in fact, just this year, Catherine Kearns and Anna Yorgiadu's work in Cyprus has specifically revealed the dynamic use of rural areas on the island in the Iron Age. By emphasizing landscapes as complex, constructed, and par as part of assemblages, rural sanctuaries emerge as much more than places created from forces emanating from urban palatial centers to state control of the land. Instead, they act as active and ever-changing parts of assemblages that contributed to the construction of religious, funerary, industrial, and social landscapes that helped to create and define the Cypriot worldview. As Yorgos Papantonio has demonstrated, even if sanctuaries were established as an integral part of the Iron Age socio-political climate, some of these survived and even thrived beyond the dissolution of the kingdoms and the integration of the island into the Ptolemaic kingdom and later into the Roman empire. Employing bottom-up approaches to landscape highlights the local meanings embedded in these spaces that transcended and in some cases outlasted their elite political use. Far from the traditional view of rural areas, including sanctuaries, as conservative or even stagnant, these spaces materialize as dynamic space constantly adopting, adapting, and even at times resisting larger regional and Mediterranean trends. To counter the urban focus of some 20th century archeology, span 
The Athenu Archaeological Project began under the direction of Mike Tomazu and systematic survey and excavation since 1990 in the Malara Valley has added to our understanding of how marginal areas in the hinterland were used and how these spaces interacted with larger centers. And these ideas were articulated in the preliminary publication Crossroads and Boundaries of our excavations, particularly by Nick Cardulius, Derek Counts, and Michael Tomazu. The Athianu Sanctuary is situated in the central lowlands of Cyprus between the Trodos and Kyrenia mountain ranges and the center of the Malara Valley on the southern edge of the large and fertile Mezaria Plain. It is located outside the city of Golgoi, modern Athianu, along routes to three of the island's largest urban centers and kingdom capitals, Lydra, Salamis, and Kition, and along routes to important hinterland urban centers Adalian and Thomasos. The sanctuary was strategically located along communication routes with several competing primary and secondary urban centers. The Mezaria Plain was in general well watered and fertile, easy to traverse, with mesas providing visual outposts dotting the margins. It is possible that the shifting borders of several kingdoms met in this large expanse, and due to the importance of the Mezaria for um, agro-pastoral activities and inland communication, several important rural sanctuaries were established throughout the plain, as noted on this map, most unfortunately looted or poorly excavated in the 19th century. Although labeling sites as rural, extra-urban, peripheral is problematic, especially in Cyprus, where we are in the dark regarding the boundaries of the kingdoms, it does seem clear that the Malara Valley was a marginal place, despite its strategic location. Excavation and survey did not reveal any settlement evidence until the early Roman period, when a sizable village and Roman homesteads were established. If there were early, earlier settlements, and the presence of tombs suggests that there were, they must have been small and limited. The scarcity of farming settlements was likely due to the lack of rainfall coupled with the dearth of streams suitable for irrigation and limited subsurface water. Periods of drought and water shortage would have been more critical for any inhabitants living here. Moreover, the paucity of amphorae and ancient roof tiles from the survey area and the fact that the earliest sledge flints used in threshing boards date to the first century BCE, this also suggests that most of the land was undeveloped and that the valley was not um, systematically exploited for use in the Iron Age. The archaeological evidence indicates that the early use of the valley was limited to the sanctuary and the tombs in the center of the valley before any adjacent farming settlements were established, likely at the time Cyprus became a Roman possession. Finally, the survey and excavations found relatively few imported wares, which suggests that the valley was relatively more isolated than other Cypriot sites from the main Mediterranean trade routes. The primary use of the valley in the Iron Age appears then to have been for funerary and religious purposes, creating a sacred landscape where the living and the dead interacted in cemeteries and where the living communicated with the divine in a sanctuary. The flat center of the valley was selected as a site of what would become a large rural sanctuary, while the nearby hill of Mahara Tepeshi, 300 meters north of and in view of the sanctuary, and an area even closer to the northeast were selected for a series of chamber tomb burials of varying sizes and types that span the Cipro archaic through Roman periods. The formalization of the Malara sanctuary in the Cipro archaic II period coincides with the first chamber tombs. And so it seems that the sixth century marks the first intense and systematic use of the valley for ritual purposes. The landscape was co-created primarily as a destination for those seeking to communicate with the dead or with the divine. Although we do not know the identities of any of the visitors to the sanctuary, the overwhelmingly local character of the things found within it suggests that visitors and ritual practitioners obtain votives and ritual paraphernalia locally, even if we have yet to find any workshop or kilns. It is likely that visitors from nearby perhaps Golgoy and smaller sediment, settlements beyond the Malara Valley, but also perhaps from further away came to the sanctuary as pilgrims or for specific events. 
The range of people coming to the sacred area each helped co-produce the sanctuary as a distinct locality, symbolically charged with meaning, and applying the new materialism and assemblage of theory approaches, we can understand that people, things, and the landscape worked together and became entangled with actions in this marginal space. With this in mind, I want to turn briefly to consider Astrid, Astrid Van Oyen's critical work on the concept of rural time. The stereotypical views of rural areas range from seeing them as conservative, backwards, isolated, and passive, to alternatively viewing them as romanticized and idyllic places removed from the negative aspects of fast urban life. And although different, Van Oyen demonstrates that both assumptions construct a different temporality for the countryside. It is differentiated as living in the past, slow and unchanging. She compares this to urban time, which is conceived of as forward-looking and innovative. Van, Oyen, Van Oyen's work and other ethnographic studies have exposed the issues with these contrasts between urban and rural spaces. And we can now understand that farming communities often have, quote, a keen eye on the future, forever adapting, innovating, and coordinating multiple temporalities. And unfortunately, I don't have a photo of my next example, but I showed you a traditional um, from Athianu uh, photograph of um, threshing here. A great example of this um, innovative right, use comes from our own area of study noted by Rick Yerkes. And at the end, in 1926, two itinerant craftsmen specializing in sledge construction hooked double threshing sledges to the only tractor at the time on Cyprus, which happened to be an Athianu. And thus they innovatively combined traditional tools with modern machine driven equipment. And so we see that the use of the Mallor Valley past and present is complex and dynamic. While the landscapes and objects within it were local, they also participated in broader island-wide stylistic, social, and religious networks. While the sanctuary was located in a marginal valley, it was the focus of wealth deposition, religious rituals, and sustained use for over a thousand years. The tenacity and importance of this particular site in the middle of the valley is demonstrated by the long use of the area for burial and ritual and by its connectivity to other places around the island. And so far from isolated or backwards, this sacred landscape was dynamically created as a deliberate place for sustained ritual use. The constructed settings of sanctuaries is important for understanding how they functioned within their created sacred landscapes. Before even entering into the Temenos, visitors would already have trekked through the sacred zone of the Malara Valley. Not only were sanctuaries a new feature of the Cipro archaic period, but this also coincided with an explosion of votive offerings. In particular, terracotta figurines and new large scale terracotta and limestone statuary. Once inside the sanctuary, it is the things dedicated in these spaces that would have made a striking visual impression on visitors. And it is to these things that we now turn. Although there are some links with past practices, the overall quantity and number of new votive types are unprecedented. As with other transitional periods, these new customs indicate new social constructions emerged as new forms and uses for material culture came into being to negotiate destabilized societies. These sanctuaries became charged spaces where the ephemeral, living beings and their actions such as prayer, sacrifice, the burning of incense, feasting, song, and dance, work together with more permanent things, votive objects, architecture, ritual equipment, to co-create dynamic assemblages. Because of their sheer number and unique qualities, there have been numerous studies on these votive offerings. As mentioned above, scholarship on Cypriot votives has emphasized these as works of art, analyzing their style, iconography, and organizing them into discrete types. In one of the first studies to go beyond formal analysis, in 1989, Joan Connolly, drawing on Sumerian parallels, posited that Cypriot votaries functioned as a substitute for the donor and rendered an ephemeral act eternal. 
these votives had a function to offer perpetual prayer to the deity. In this view, votives are manifestations of personal piety directly linked to their original dedicator and their motivation for dedication. And in this role, they represent and reflect contemporary social values. Subsequent studies further explored how votive objects, again, focusing on large limestone statuary, were placed and what that meant for the use of the sanctuary space by things and people. Richard Semph and Lone Wright Sorensen have both suggested hypothetical arrangements for the statues at the Apollo Sanctuary at Adalian that juxtaposed rows of statues with processions of living worshipers or worshipers cluster, clustering around the altar with votives, arrangements that potentially blurred the lines between stone and flesh worshipers. Indeed, as Semph notes, several sanctuaries preserve evidence from statue bases that limestone statues were grouped in rows or clusters. And finally, the only preserved in situ arrangement of votives at Aya Arini preserves terracotta votives arranged in a semicircle, theatrical style, facing the altar as if substitutes for worshipers forever watching a ritual or awaiting the divine. In these reconstructions and the rare Aya Arini find, two things are privileged, the original moment of creation and dedication and the ocular experience. The sense of sight is paramount. Most votary images are frontal, standing and strict attention, some with exaggerated eyes that connect them to the divine. And rows of, or arrangements of votaries are visually linked to rows of worshipers inhabiting the same space. Although the votives are conceived as having agency, it is limited in these reconstructions to enacting the will of the donors. The, voter, the votaries literally functioned as, sorry, the votaries literally functioned as petrified versions of worshipers set in stone or fired in clay, immobile and passive. This fixity is linked to their assumed timeless original intent to offer perpetual prayer on behalf of their donor. This visual experience is also emphasized by studies that focus on what the type, the style, the attributes, and the dress of the figures communicated. The continuity of motivation, types, and styles suggest a view of sanctuaries and votives as conservative. But if we expand our view of Cypriot sanctuaries using these new theoretical lenses, However, a more dynamic picture emerges. Using new materialism and assemblage theory approaches, we can understand these spaces as in flux with all parts of the assemblage from the human worshipers to the humble terracotta figurines to the landscape interacting to co-create vibrant events. The votives can be seen to function not as passive petrified worshipers, but as active and essential parts of the assemblage. And rather than conservative, standing in attention for generations, the assemblage is in a constant state of change and a continual state of being created anew, changing and decaying. By expanding our chronological view of dedication, we can see that at many sanctuaries, votives seem to have been curated perhaps by cult personnel or even worshipers, some remained on display for long periods of time where other, while others were moved, buried, or reused for other purposes. The Malara Sanctuary, despite its marginal location as we have demonstrated, was one of the longest used ritual spaces on the island. Established at the end of the Cypro-Geometric III period in the eighth century, the sanctuary flourished in the Cypro-Archaic II and classical periods when the open-air temenos was built up with a series of small structures. One larger open structure highlighted in red and a smaller structure highlighted in blue. There were also hearth altars in addition and the deities worshiped, um, received thousands of offerings of limestone statues, um, and, light and terracotta figurines. At the end of the fourth century, when Cyprus was subsumed into the Hellenistic kingdom, the sanctuary was completely reorganized. Earlier votives were gathered up and used as fill to level a redesigned space. A larger, more regular sanctuary wall 
seen here in red, demarcated the sacred area with a monumentalized entrance on the north side. A large Pise platform altar, likely with earlier antecedents, marked the open courtyard. And we can also now um, have see evidence for arrangements of votives. And here you see um, statue bases in a row. And we've also recently uncovered several uh, platforms and display areas down here in the southern part of the sanctuary. Our knowledge of the sanctuary used during the Roman period is still tenuous, but the presence of several Roman lamps that date to now the fourth or even the fifth century AD, including one with the Christian cross and Roman pottery is clear evidence that the sanctuary was still in use and underscores the long and complicated use of this area. But examining the phases chronologically or by type presents a linear view of sanctuary use, when in fact our excavations have provided clear evidence that time could be collapsed. For the fourth century reorganization, early, some of the earlier votives were gathered up and used as fill to level the area. Although they appear haphazardly included with dirt, pebbles, and cobbles, they continued to imbue the space with their sacred presence. Beyond this, we do know that certain votives were selected to be retained and they remained on display in the new Hellenistic and Roman sanctuary. We often privilege sight and display, but we should not assume that votives, divine images and ritual instruments that were not in view were any less powerful in their varied context as votives that remained on display. And there was likely a more complex interplay between sacred objects that were hidden and unhidden. We have several examples um, at the sanctuary of earlier votives being intentionally retained, not placed in the construction fill, and likely on display in the reorganized sanctuary. And this stunning photograph shows you one example. Here we have a Cipro archaic male votary wearing Cypriot shorts and a t-shirt lying just over a Hellenistic statuette of the god Pan. Both were found in the same um, level resting on the Hellenistic sanctuary floor. Votives separated by hundreds of years or more seem to have been displayed together, and this is not an isolated incident. We have found many examples of Cipro archaic and classical figurines and statues in the Hellenistic through Roman sanctuary levels. And here I show you um, one example. We have a Cipro archaic terracotta warrior figurine and um, a terracotta mask dating to the very end of the Cipro archaic beginning of Cipro classical period. Both were found in the same level, which was completely Hellenistic, only Hellenistic ceramics. And it seems to be associated with some sort of platform or Hellenistic display area that we recently uncovered. And here we have other examples um, of a Cipro archaic Egyptianizing head and a Cipro classical votary, again, also both found in the later Hellenistic sanctuary. Beyond selecting older votives for display in the new space, several larger limestone statues were built into stone courses of the new Peribolos. Here you see a life-size votary statue built into the new, more monumental sanctuary wall. And here, a limestone face from a bearded votary also built into the new wall stone courses. While some of these repurposed statuettes were likely visible in the wall, others like this face were not. Both have been reused in new forms with new significance than the original intent of the donor. And such practices are not unique to Malara. At Malara and other sanctuaries, we have evidence that votives were displayed together on bases and pedestals, accumulated in groups, rested against walls, plastered into walls, placed on benches, accumulated around altars, hung on walls, or maybe even trees. Although larger votives like limestone statuettes and statues were plastered into bases or walls. And here I'm showing you one of our uh, display areas with statue bases. And right here, you can see little feet from a statuette that were plastered into the base here. But smaller votives could easily be moved. They could be touched, moved, displayed, redisplayed, handled for use or as part of rituals. But even fixed statues, as we just saw, could be moved, built into new walls. 
nothing was permanent. And so just the opposite of permanent petrified versions of worshipers existing in a stagnant eternal time, these votives were entangled with worshipers, things, and the landscape as they constantly entered into new assemblages, different relationships, and changed meaning and possibly even function. They had complicated and often long use histories. More than this, they actively co-created object worlds. Lynn Meskel has described object worlds as an enmeshing that combines persons, objects, deities, and all manner of immaterial things together in ways that cannot easily be disentangled or separated taxonomically. In addition, these object worlds are fluid and lacking containment. They spill out from their original assemblage. They are not static, but are dynamic and changing from the moment of their creation to the moment of their reuse. In her exploration of Sumerian sculpture, Jean Evans concludes that Sumerian votive identities were not fixed at the moment of their origin, but shifted repeatedly over time through human interactions to produce multiple meanings of each object. In Cypriot sanctuaries too, each dedicated object had a meaning that extended beyond its original creation and function and acquired new significance as it became entangled with other votive objects, humans, animals, and the built sanctuary. Monwright Sorensen describes the phenomenon of new Cypriot votives found together with old ones as presenting viewers with different pasts in a continually forward moving present. And so they were instrumental in upholding links with the past and for marking out the sanctuary as a place of memory. These rural sanctuaries then were not stable and a process of becoming as votives could be, as Jean Evans remarks, disassembled and assembled, made and remade. This argues against any notion of an eternal rural time stuck in the past, and also against any straightforward connection between object, representation, and meaning. Moving beyond our scholarly emphasis on periodization, which privileges the initial creation, motivation, and use, we can understand the complex entanglement that occurred over time between objects and people. For example, a Cipro classical statue found in a Hellenistic floor level is a Hellenistic statue. A Cipro archaic limestone votary built into a Cipro classical wall is now part of a classical assemblage. Separating the analysis of votives by material, chronology, and stylistic evolution does not do service for their complicated uses. And so far from inert, votive displays, they were dynamic, vibrant things with multiple uses and meaning as each generation of worshipers recreated meanings and identities distinct from the original, uh, original motivations of the donor. Iconic images like this in situ votives grouped around the altar at Aya Arini, now assembled frozen in museums in Stockholm and Nicosia, or arrangements like the Frangiza one constructed during excavation and again created in a static museum display are misleading and in some ways contribute to the assumption that rural sanctuaries were stuck in eternal time. When in reality, these arrangements like Aya Arini depict a single moment at the time of disuse and decay as the sanctuary was flooded and fell out of use only to enter into a new assemblage as it was excavated and entered into relationships with 20th century archeologists and audiences. As we have explored, sanctuaries were places where things seep from their boundaries to interact with worshipers through generations. The ultimate function of sanctuaries, however, was to facilitate communication with the divine. And so for the last part of my talk, I want to hone in on two ways that I think Cypriot Votis votives accomplish this um, through presencing the divine and through the power of accumulation and repetition. Sanctuaries were spaces where the ultimate boundary could be exploded, that separating humans from gods. Objects work together with the landscape, worshipers, and events in the sanctuary to presence the divine. This concept based on Gumbrecht's idea of the production of presence was further developed 
by Beate Pongratz Leiston and Karen Sonic to explore how images of the divine can exert agency and can even transmit their divine agency to other objects or people. For Gumbrecht, producing presence meant to put things into reach so that they can be touched. But Pongratz, Leiston, and Sonic go further to assert that presencing can use multiple modes of making the immaterial material, accessible, and relatable. Images of the divine and of worshipers were thus much more than representations, but functioned instead as presentations that actively brought the divine into the sanctuary space, where they encountered images of votary and living people through actions and events. And so at Malara, images of divinities, um, Zeus, Amon, Artemis, Bess, Heracles, Pan, interact through dedication, the burning of incense, display with images of worshipers. And this is also related to Af Alfred Gell's assertion that art objects were part of a quote, system of action intended to change the world rather than encode symbolic propositions about it. This presencing, I argue, is made more powerful at Malara and other Cypriot sanctuaries because of the repetition of imagery and accumulation of set types of votives. Although Malara received thousands of offerings on display for generations and retained for other purposes for longer, even if taken off display, Many scholars have noted the very limited repertoire of types, which seems to be further bound by the deity worshiped. And at Malara, as many of you know, we have um, a lot of the same types, right? For me, it's warriors, 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 right? Repeated over and over again. This repetition has been understood as a feature of Cypriot religious conservatism because of the assumed timeless intent of the dedications and the duration of artistic styles after they had fallen out of favor in the Greek world, Cypriot religion, um, and more specifically rural religion, and the style and type of votive production is often portrayed as highly conventional. Indeed, Cypriot sculptors and choroplasts did seem to maintain certain types and styles with little variation for long periods of time. As we explored above, however, an assemblage approach sees things as always in a state of becoming. The multiplication of images, especially ones presented as a group, could be interpreted in another way. There is power in repetition, and this concept is illustrated repeatedly in Cypriot art. As just one example from our own site, uh, here we see a wall plaque that likely hung on the wall outside the entryway to our sanctuary. Um, we see Bess repeated three times, likely to serve a protective function. And this is more um, probably known to you by the very famous Amethyst sarcophagus, where on the short side, we again have Bess repeated four times. And on the other short side, uh, nude females repeated also four times, perhaps also for protection. So the replication produces the power of the image. Beyond uh, repetition of sh the sheer number of one type or the repli replication of one image on a single object, at Malara, we've also found concentration of types in certain locations. For example, a series of limestone dancing statuettes were found in a small area of the sanctuary. And most notably, many of you might have seen this from the work of Clay Kofer. We have significant numbers of pan statuettes, which are very concentrated in one part of the sanctuary. And here I'm showing you the distribution map of pans found in 2017. Um, and this year we found over 50 fragments from at least 20 different statues. And we joked at the time that this was the year of pandemonium, right? This extreme number of pans in a concentrated space. But in 2019, we increased this number by at least double, and we now have evidence for at least 80 pan statuettes. And finally, from our last excavation season, which was sadly pre-pandemic in 2019, we had just uncovered this deposit at the end of the season. And so interpretation is very preliminary, but it seems to be a purposeful deposition of four limestone statuettes. Um, here we see pan, pan, Artemis, and then lying perpendicular here is a robed votary figure. Um, so this is perhaps a carefully placed deposit um, of um, a, a repetitious number of pans here. 
Chris Gosden, working on objects from Roman Britain, has explored how displays of groups of similar objects create what he calls stylistic universes that have an effect on the viewer. They can, quote, suggest thought and mental representation. In essence, they can act on future producers of objects now bound by canons of style. Gosden concludes that in this way, objects can be socially powerful in a recognized manner. And while several scholars have noted that limited repertoires of styles and types serve a practical function to enable efficient production of sufficient quantities to meet high demands, it can equally apply that the generality of type or style as we have on Cyprus serves to make these objects usable as each worshiper or generation can reinterpret them. The large quantities of repetitious votive types with minor stylistic changes displayed in sanctuaries throughout Cyprus is therefore not indicative of a lack of creativity or an inherent conservativeness, but just the opposite. Such patterns could enchant and actively shape the mental processes of sanctuary visitors and craftspeople and emanated agency beyond their initial creation and dedication. And so, as I hope my, uh, my talk has demonstrated, the rich and complicated world of Cypriot sanctuaries becomes even more powerful and complex when we consider them as vibrant assemblages in which things, people, and landscapes work together to produce sacred space. Thank you. Thank you so much, Erin. That was very interesting. Um, I, yeah, my mind is reeling. I'm sure there must be many, many questions. Um, does anyone have a question they would like to jump in with at this stage or do I get to begin? Okay. Um, first of all, I found it really interesting and excuse my ignorance of Iron Age matters, but that the cemeteries and the sanctuary are so closely inter intertwined in terms of the use and the chronology. And their relationship in the landscape, and it seems to be clearer perhaps at Athenu than at other sites that are more sort of overbuilt these days. Do you have a feeling that the sanctuary worshippers had anything to do with some participants in mortuary ritual as well, or are they two distinct things? Uh, we, well, we don't know that for sure, right? But we, we, we do have some overlap in material that we find in the tombs and in the sanctuary. So I think that their use is related in some way. Um, but our interpretation is really um, limited because most of our, all of our tombs were looted. <laughs> um, and so um, what we can say about the tombs is very restricted and limited. So I think just because of their visual proximity and how close they were, that there must have been some um, relationship between the people using the tombs and the people using the cemetery. But I don't think we can say much more than that. Sure. Um, Chris Walsek, you have your hand up. Would you like to ask your question? Oh, thanks. Hi, Aaron. Hi, Chris. <laughs> no, Chris is my I, uncle. <laughs> I'm, a, I'm a meteorologist, atmospheric scientist. Are there any tree ring climate records from the era that you are studying? Oh, gosh. <laughs> yeah, this is not my area. I, I don't know. There certainly isn't we haven't found any in the Malora Valley, um, but that's that's outside my area. Maybe some some people in the audience are more expert in this than I am. Well, there, there must be trees on Cyprus, right? Yeah. There is a lot of work being done to try yeah. and sort of um, get the tree ring record going back. And Stuart Manning of Cornell University is um, working very hard with a team also from the Cyprus Institute on this. And they've got, but I don't think they've quite made it back this far as yet, but if you um, take a look at Sturt Manning at Cornell and um, Britta Lawrenson in the lab at Cornell there, they've, they're the people doing the work on this. Beautiful, thank you. And we have a question from Nancy Sowant. Can you say more about the apparent deliberate breakage of many of the objects before their placement in a secondary context? <laughs> yeah. It's not, I don't know if it's clear. I mean, some of them were broken before they were um, reused as fill. Um, I haven't 
detected any meaningful patterns. Again, we are still in the process of studying all these in detail. From the figurines, it seems that they break at weak points. So I don't know if they were deliberately broken, you know, heads break off, arms and legs break off. So, so far I haven't detected any um, meaningful patterns other than maybe they were um, kicking around for a while, right? Because they weren't whole when they were buried in the fill or maybe they were broken when they were put into the fill. And it's really hard to tell the chronology of, of the breakage. And we also have a question from Yorgos Papantoniou. Thank you very much, Erin. I find interesting the context of the Roman lamps. Is there archaeological context indicating something of their function? Can it be also that a, ri a ritual function or merely practical? Yeah, so the Roman phase is the least understood phase of the sanctuary. Um, we've only recently found that much later material, and right now we don't have a lot of it. Um, it's being studied by Jody Gordon, um, as you know, and so we don't have a lot of lamps, and so it's not certain how the sanctuary is being used, especially in the third and fourth and maybe even to the fifth century. Um, yeah, it could just be practical. Maybe people are just coming to take a look. <laughs> um, it does, it's not necessarily ritual. Um, we also know that there's some interaction between the Roman settlement and the sanctuary. Uh, one of the statuettes of Zeus Amon, the incense burner, was taken from the sanctuary, or we assume it was taken from the sanctuary, and we found it in that settlement. So there seems to be some interaction between those two, but we don't have enough material, and the little we do is still being studied to, to say for certain what the nature of the use was. Yorgos had a subsidiary question that I didn't quite catch in time, asking, do we see any difference when it comes to comparing the existence of lamps in the earlier periods? Um, you mean difference in terms of quantity or where they're found? I think we do have earlier lamps, so we know that there are rituals involving lamps, um, but we don't know. Yeah, we have a lot more earlier lamps than Roman lamps. Um, a lot of the contexts are from, as you, anyone who's been to our site knows, um, looters pits are everywhere. Um, so I don't, I don't know enough about the context of all the lamps. I haven't done a study on that. Um, but I think that the, just the quantity, there's a big difference. There's far fewer from the Roman period than earlier periods. Um, while we wait for people to muster their thoughts, I was wondering, and this again is probably just too tricky given the sort of disturbance at the site and everything, but do you have any idea about the choices made in which types of votives to retain in later periods? Um, Hmm. Yeah, like what you're asking, what, what, what's the criteria used for what votives get put in fill, which get built into the walls, which get displayed. Um, and I don't know if we know that, right? Obviously, there's a practical function, right? Large limestone statues um, are sort of a practical function on a wall, right? Versus a, a, a smaller figurine or something like that. Um, but I don't know if we have any um, we found a lot of different types of figurines and statues in the later sanctuary, so they, they don't seem to be re retaining a single type, right? Um, so I, I haven't detected any evidence that we can use to, to try to guess what they were thinking. I thought it might be a wishful Yeah, thing. it would be cool if they only kept like certain types of statues, right? That would be really neat, but so far I haven't found any patterns. Does anyone have any further questions? Would anyone like to um, unmute themselves and ask her their question in person? Maria Yukovu, yes, please. I was, I was just writing, but it's easier because I wanted to, to, to thank Erin to begin with because she shared with us the latest pandemonium. Yeah. <laughs> thank you. And, and I would also like you to help me understand whether you have suggested that the landscape around Malura Malura, um, was lacking human settlement or human use. What, are you referring to the area directly around the Malura sanctuary or are you referring to a wider landscape? Because at the same time you mentioned Wolji and you, you refer to Wolji as a town. Am I making any sense? Yeah. Um, 
this is actually something that we talk about on the excavation a lot. Um, so I was basing my conclusions based on the survey material that was published in Crossroads and Boundaries by Rick Yerkes and Nick Cardulius, um, and the study of the pottery from that survey. Um, so the survey did not find any settlement in the Malheur Valley. So not just the sanctuary, but the whole valley. Um, but that's really odd that there's no settlements, right? Because we do have tombs there. And so I think most of us think there was some sort of settlement or settlements there. But even if there were settlements, which is likely, um, they were likely very small, which explains why we don't have the, why we're not picking them up in, in the survey. Um, but we don't know that for sure, but that's just sort of a guess. And also based on the, the Rick Yerkes and, and Nick Cardulius, the, the lack of water in the valley, right, until they're able to sink wells in, in the later periods um, would also explain why the settlements were likely very small. It's very interesting because I think it's a pattern where we have evidence of rural sanctuaries. We, we seem to be lacking the direct, clear, visual evidence of settlements. And it's something we have to look into mm -hmm. in order to understand how the landscape is being used because this is, this is the, the number one valley of Cyprus. This is where everything is being produced for annual survival. So we're missing something, missing something in the way people were treating that landscape, mm -hmm. where they were living. And maybe they live in small settlements, mm -hmm. but they're they are certainly working there. Yeah. This is, this is the most important valley we have in Cyprus. And it's huge So for the island. Yeah. But was is Wolgi for you a town based on um, uh, on the um, small excavation conducted by the Thessaloniki University many years ago? I mean, mm -hmm. are you referring to an actual town, small center? Oh, a Gogoi? Yeah, I mean, we don't, yeah, there, there's definitely settlement there. That's um, outside the Malara Valley, though, right? So we're just talking about the immediate Malheur Valley, but yeah, certainly probably the main visitors came from Golgoy and maybe other sites outside as well. Um, that was beyond the survey area of AAP. So yeah, certainly they're coming from that area. Thank you. Does anyone have any further questions they would like to ask? Um, oh yes, we do have one from Jennifer Webb. Is there any possible connection between the Iron Age Sanctuary at Malura and the earlier Late Bronze Age Sanctuary at Ethienu that was also not associated with the settlement? Hmm. So that would be really fascinating if we could have a connection between the two, but we have a gap. Um, so we have a, uh, in the Malura Valley, we don't have any Bronze Age um, material and early geometric material. So it really seems to be new use of the area at the end of the Cipro geometric period. Um, so there's definitely a gap in the immediate vicinity. Um, and I don't know, we haven't found any other direct evidence to connect um, the, the earlier late Bronze Age sanctuary, which now is inaccessible, right, um, to our sanctuary. And I think the chronological gap makes that a hard argument to make. Thank you. Um, we have Nicholas Blackwell, your hand is up. Would you like to ask your question, please? Sure, yeah. Thanks a lot, Aaron. That was fantastic. Thanks. I had a question about the um, about the altar, and and I guess this is something I should know, having worked <laughs> at Athena <laughs> at some point. What is there evidence of a burnt sacrifice at the sanctuary? And if so, like, you know, how much is there in terms of like burnt debris? And if you imagine, I mean, we have so many statuaries and, and votives, should we expect more sort of Bothroy and deposits, deposits of charred materials and burnt bones? My recollection is that's relatively limited given sort of the, the duration of the, uh, the sanctuary for such a long time. So yeah. And, yeah. and that could certainly lead to questions about sort of the 
the theatrical nature of sacrifice and sort of mm -hmm. who is viewing it and and particularly the Aya Irini uh, image, sort of, you know, with these statues arranged around mm -hmm. the altar. Um, anyway, yeah. Yeah, so we do, David Reese, as you know, is studying our animal bones. And also I've, I've, I'm revisiting um, it with Kate Grossman because when I was working on uh, animal masks, which I think are related to sacrifice, I realized like we need a lot more <laughs> information on Iron Age animal sacrifice, which was a fascinating topic. So we do have burnt animal bones. So we, we know that they were sacrificing animals um, at our site. And there is some around the altar but not as much as you would like, right? The altar's, I, don't, I can't remember the last time you were there, Nick, but the altar is really big. It looks weird because looters have scooped out part of it. <laughs> um, so we don't have as much animal bone, burnt animal bone in the immediate vicinity of the altar, but we have enough to know that they were conducting animal sacrifice there. I think your other question is about if, if our sanctuary was in use for such a long period of time, right? You would expect that they would um, sweep up the debris from animal sacrifice and these other votives and put them in more carefully curated or buried Bothroy. And we haven't really found those. And we have two ideas why. One, um, our site is just riddled with modern looter, looters pits. And as Nick Blackwell knows, we have pits within pits that connect to other pits. And so figuring out <laughs> where the pits end and how they're related is a nightmare. And we suspect that some of the things we might have thought were 20th century pits might have been, some of those might have been ancient pits. It, get, it gets really complicated. So we might not have been able to detect some of those. The other thing is the reorganization of the sanctuary obliterated almost all the earlier evidence. We just have those walls and the material, but we haven't found hardly any um, pure archaic or classical level. So there might have been pits for these things, but they were obliterated with later construction. Did that answer your question? Yep, thanks. Uh, Yogos Papadzhniya is asking, did you look for any Bothroy outside the sanctuary walls? Um, not specifically. Um, we Most of the excavation has focused on finding the walls and, and the boundaries of the sanctuary. There has been some um, test areas, but none of those have picked up both right. But again, we haven't looked extensively for that. But yeah, that could be another explanation is that they're outside the sanctuary. I was just checking I didn't accidentally lower someone's hand who wanted to ask a question earlier because I, I wondered if I when I was lowering Nick's hand, I lowered someone else's hand. Was there someone else who had wanted to raise your hand at all? No, I guess not we uh, to answer it yeah we did do we did do geophysics and, and that did go outside the walls but the results were um the qual from what i understand this is not my area of expertise um the quality wasn't good enough to really discern much from that survey okay well if we don't have any further questions um i would like to once again thank very much Erin Mothic Everett for this really fascinating lecture and I have learned a lot. Um, I'm now going to press stop recording and anyone who would like to stick around for a chat is more than welcome to do so. Thank you very much again Erin. Thank you. Thanks Chris. <laughs>